M S W Media. Hello and welcome to the Daily Beans for Wednesday, August 10th, 2022. Today, the FBI has executed a search warrant on sitting member of Congress Scott Perry. The Mar-a-Lago search appears to have been focused on whether Trump and his aides withheld items. A court has ruled that the House Ways and Means Committee can obtain Trump's taxes. And Doug Mastriano left his 1-6 committee deposition after his demands weren't met. I'm Allison Gill. And I'm Dana Goldberg. Pretty short intro today, Dana, but very big stories. Uh, you know what? Sometimes they're, I was going to say, you're so inappropriate joke, but yeah, just you know, shorter <laughs> isn't always bad. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's the motion of the news. Some, It's not a grower. It's a, no, I have no idea what's <laughs> happening now. Yeah, we're, we're, we're out of your territory. We just jumped the shark. Maybe we should keep going. <laughs> <laughs> we humped the shark. We did. I'm going to be talking with Pete Strzok later to discuss. He's like like the foremost expert I can think of on counterintelligence stuff. And we're going to talk about the raid on Mar-a-Lago. But wow, we just have some breaking news. The, the majors haven't even confirmed it yet. And when I say the majors, I mean anyone other than Fox News. And so we're going to talk about that at the top of the hot notes. Hot notes. All right. I've never led with a story from Fox News, like in my life. No. But and here it goes. Yes. Everyone just bear with us. <laughs> just, yeah, just bear with us. Republican Rep Scott Perry of Pennsylvania says that the FBI has confiscated his cell phone. Perry, in an exclusive statement, told Fox News on Tuesday that while traveling with his family earlier in the day, he was approached by three FBI agents who handed him a warrant and requested that he turn over his cell phone. Requested. That's cute. The confiscation of the congressman's personal phone comes one day after FBI agents raided former President Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate in Palm Beach, Florida. Quote, this morning, while traveling with my family, three FBI agents visited me and seized my cell phone. They made no attempt to contact my lawyer. Like, that's a fucking thing. I know. <laughs> Who would have made arrangements for them to have my phone if that was their wish? I'm outraged, though not surprised, that the FBI, under the direction of Merrick Garland's Department of Justice, would seize the phone of a sitting member of Congress, he said in his statement. My phone contains info about my legislative and political activities and personal private discussions with my wife, family, constituents, and friends, and a whole lot of crimes. He actually didn't say that. <laughs> None of this is the government's business. Mm. OK, uh, except it's not just the FBI who does this. They have to get a judge to sign off on it. I also like that he included legislative and political activities and then decided it's none of the government's business, which is actually government business. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I want to look at this in context since, uh, you know, mainstream media probably won't or they've so far decided not to, at least at Fox News. Scott Perry was heavily involved in pushing the Italian election interference conspiracy. Do you remember when... Uh, they wanted the Department of Justice and the Department of Defense and Department of Homeland Security to seize voting machines. And Rudy was like, there has to be foreign election interference to even try to do that. Although, as we learned yesterday, that guy running for Michigan attorney general decided to seize some voting machines on his own and could now probably go to jail for it. So he was doing that. He was also this is Perry. He was also pushing hard for Donald Trump to install Jeffrey Clark as the acting attorney general. So Clark could send out his bunk letters to the swing states telling them the Department of Justice was investigating their elections as a pretext for them to certify fraudulent slates of electors, because they all knew that if these fraudulent slates of electors weren't certified, they were dead on arrival. It was illegal. That information comes from all that comes from the one six committee testimony from Rosen, Donahue and Steve Engel. Now, Scott Perry also asked for a pardon, and that's according to Cassidy Hutchinson's testimony and Cassidy Hutchinson is the aide to Mark Meadows. And we know Meadows was seen burning documents in his office fireplace after having met with Scott Perry. So I asked myself if this warrant could be related to the fraudulent elector scheme of which Jeffrey Clark was a part. 
And, and, you know, Jeffrey Clark being a part of it is what allowed the Department of Justice Office of Inspector General to seize Eastman's phone. Because as I said yesterday, they said in that court filing, you don't have to work for the DOJ, but if you were in a criminal conspiracy with somebody who did, we're allowed to take your shit. But Perry told Fox News that these were FBI agents, not Department of Justice Office of Inspector General officers like the ones that confiscated Eastman and Clark's stuff. And does that mean that it's not part of the fraudulent elector scheme? I don't know. But it could mean that this is part of the Mar-a-Lago thing. Meadows is a common link between those two things. Meadows was one of the seven people appointed by Trump to be his representatives to the National Archives, along with Cipollone and Philbin, who were also both recently subpoenaed by the Department of Justice. And Meadows met and texted frequently with Scott Perry. And on at least five occasions, Perry told Meadows, let's move this discussion over to Signal. I feel like this is about withheld documents more than fraudulent elector schemes, maybe a National Archives, you know, Presidential Records Act stuff. But we don't know. I just find the Meadows connection interesting, especially since Trump's lawyers recently advised Trump to stop talking to Meadows. (laughs) So I think Meadows might have flipped. That's my I, That would be amazing. I know. All right. Speaking of the former guy, federal appeals court on Tuesday signed off on a House Ways and Means Committee request to obtain former President Donald Trump's tax returns Ooh. from the IRS. Now, the three to nothing, three to nothing ruling from the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals is a blow to Donald, who has argued for years in court against releasing his tax returns to any investigators. A trial level judge he appointed, he appointed while president previously rejected his arguments in the case. He's like, I know you gave me this job, but fuck off. Now, the appeals court said the mandate in the case would be issued seven days after any appeal Donald makes in the circuit court is resolved. Now, Trump may also appeal the case directly to the Supreme Court. I'm sure he will. This litigation is separate. It's separate from the House Select Committee's investigation into the January 6th riot. So let's keep that clear. Now, the majority opinion, which was written by Circuit Court Judge David Sintel, said that Ways and Means Committee Chairman Richard Neal's request for the records was within the scope of his committee's inquiry. And the court also rejected Donald's argument, claiming that the request had a retaliatory motive, making it invalid because everything's got a retaliatory motive to Donald. And this is a quote. While it's possible that Congress may attempt to threaten the sitting president with an invasive request after leaving office, every president... Wait, wait. Congress may attempt to threaten the sitting president after leaving office. Okay, just checking. All right. Yep. I was like, wait, wait, what? After leaving office, every president takes office knowing that he will be subject to the same laws as all other citizens upon leaving office. This is a feature of our democratic republic, not a bug. That's from Santel's opinion, okay? Neil has requested the returns under a law that allows disclosure of an individual's tax returns to the committee, and a request that Donald administration, of course, has rebuffed. The appeals court on Tuesday said that Donald did not prevail in his argument that as a former president, his records should not be turned over. That's bullshit. Just how many times can this guy lose? (laughs) I know, he's like, but, 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 but. And now this is another quote. In this case, the need for the Trump party's information to inform potential legislation overrides the burden to the executive branch largely because that burden is so tenuous. Again, that was Santel. And he is a Reagan appointee. He wrote that in his opinion. Judge Karen Henderson, a judge, and I love that they're pointing out in this article, by the way, who appointed these judges so that everyone's not like, this is political. So Judge Karen Henderson, who is a, a George W., George H. Bush appointee, and Robert Wilkins happens to be an Obama appointee, also agreed with the decision, though Henderson wrote that she believed there should be more scrutiny on a request like this that would have implications for the presidency. Now, the case stems from a lawsuit Neil filed in 2019 seeking a court order compelling the IRS, then under the Trump administration, to turn over Trump's tax returns. The litigation moved at super slow pace that it outlasted Trump's presidency, which is part of the problem. And in July of last year, the Justice Department signaled it was switching positions in the case in favor of the committee obtaining the the returns. Now, District Judge Trevor McFadden, also a Trump appointee, last December granted requests from the department and the House to dismiss the case, prompting Trump's appeal to the D.C. court. (laughs) 
Oh, that's fun. Lots we've been of following people that he one. appointed. Don't give a fuck. <clears throat> yeah, we've been uh, following that one for a while. And the legislative purpose, by the way, of obtaining Trump's tax returns by, by Richie Neal at the House Ways and Means Committee was they wanted to look at the presidential audit, the presidential tax audit program. They thought that, you know, if if they didn't catch any shit in Trump's taxes, that maybe that audit program is broken. <laughs> so they wanted to, <laughs> you know, revisit that legislation. <laughs> and uh, that's part that's part of it. And of course, we know House Ways and Means Committee can obtain anyone's taxes for any reason, retaliatory or not. In fact, the reason doesn't matter. There doesn't have to be a legislative purpose, Dana. Somebody can stand up and say, I just hate that guy's fucking face. I want totally. their tax returns. And they have to hand them over because that's what House and Ways Committee gets to do. We have more info on the Mar-a-Lago raid in the months before the FBI's dramatic move to execute a search warrant at the Florida home of the former guy and crack open his safe to look for items. Federal authorities grew increasingly concerned that Trump or his lawyers and aides had not, in fact, returned all the documents and other material that were government property. That's according to people familiar with the discussions. I know we're all shocked. Officials became suspicious that when Trump gave back items to the archives about seven months ago, either the former president or people close to him held on to key records despite a Justice Department investigation into the handling of 15 boxes and materials sent to the former president's private club in the waning days of his presidency. Over months of discussions on the subject, some officials also came to suspect Donald's representatives were not truthful at times. What? That's according to people familiar with the matter who spoke on the condition of anonymity. Uh, I wonder if that's Meadows. On Tuesday, a lawyer for Trump said the agents who brought the court approved warrant to Mar-a-Lago a day earlier took about 12 more boxes after conducting their search. Out of the basement, by the way, which makes me think that that's why he kept talking about Joe Biden being in his basement. Just because, you know, he always they blames project people. fuck out of everything. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. People familiar with the investigation said that the Justice Department and FBI officials traveled down to Mar-a-Lago this past spring, a meeting first reported by CNN. The official spoke to Trump's representatives, inspected the storage space where the documents were held and expressed concern. The former president or people close to him still had items that should be in government custody. By that point, officials at the National Archives had been aggressively contacting people in Trump's orbit to demand the return of documents they believe were covered by the PRA, the Presidential Records Act. That's according to two people familiar who also spoke on the condition of anonymity. Christina Bob, idiot, lawyer for Trump, said Trump's lawyers engaged in discussions with the Justice Department in the spring over materials held at Mar-a-Lago. And at that time, the former president's legal team searched through two to three dozen boxes of material contained in a storage area, hunting for documents that could be considered presidential records and turned over several items that might meet the definition, she said. And I have to think, you mean, you know how Trump's been selling some old Trump wine glasses to try to raise money and stuff? I feel like when they were in the basement looking for these documents, they found like boxes of old Trump steaks and Trump wine glasses. Just listing it up and then <laughs> blowing off dust. We have boxes of these. We could make a mint. I, I can just see that happening. In June, Christina Bob said she and Trump lawyer Evan Corcoran met with Jay Bratt, the chief of the counterintelligence and export control section at the Justice Department, who handles, by the way, FARA cases, along with several investigators. Trump stopped by the meeting as it began to greet the investigators, but was not interviewed. The lawyer showed the federal officials the boxes and Bratt and the others spent some time looking through the material. Bob says the Justice Department officials commented they didn't believe the storage unit was properly secure, so Trump officials added a lock to the facility. It wasn't locked. <laughs> when FBI agents searched the property Monday, Bob added they broke through that lock to get into that basement. The FBI removed about 12 boxes that had been stored in the basement storage area. Bob did not share the search warrant left by the agents, but said that it indicated agents were investigating possible violations of laws dealing with the handling of classified material and the Presidential Records Act. Ooh. Some of Trump's advisors have urged him to move up his expected announcement that he will run for president in 2024 and to make it soon at Mar-a-Lago with the FBI search as a backdrop. But Trump has made no commitment to doing so, one person with direct knowledge said. Two people familiar with the initial recovery of the materials at Mar-a-Lago said the archives officials believed that more records were missing and were skeptical, skeptical that Trump had handed everything over. As the investigation gained steam, some Trump advisors have sought to stay away from the issue, fearing it would become a messy legal and political situation. After Monday's search, lawyers close to Trump sought advice or recommendations for criminal defense attorneys who could represent Trump, 
And that's according to a person familiar. So he's looking for a better lawyer than the shit ball lawyers that he has. <laughs> One person familiar with the investigation said agents were conducting a court authorized search as part of a long running examination into why documents, some of them top secret, were taken to the former president's private club and residence instead of being shipped to the National Archives when Trump left office. The Presidential Records Act, which requires the preservation of memos, letters, notes, emails, faxes, and written communications related to a president's official duties. That's what the PRA is. So I don't know if this has to do with the Perry phone confiscation, uh, you know, if this is uh, mishandling classified documents. Was he selling these? What, what, did he bury them in Ivana's grave on in Bedminster? Like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> What's going on with this? But we're getting details little by little. We should know more fairly soon, I think. Absolutely. We're going to go on to some more Republican fuckery. Republican gubernatorial candidate Doug Mastriano reportedly ended his interview with the January 6th committee after 15 minutes, which is probably eight minutes longer than never mind. The Pennsylvania state senator wanted to record the deposition about his actions on January 6th at the U.S. Capitol or wait until after November election. But the House Select Committee declined his offer. Shocking. A source told Hmm. CNN that Mastriano, quote, didn't answer a single question during his virtual appearance before the committee. His attorney, Tim Parlator, sent a letter last week saying that the GOP gubernatorial candidate who frequently streams his public appearances on Facebook would not testify unless he could be recorded. He wanted to stream this on Facebook is what it sounds like. Yeah, he wanted to his own recording of it so that yes. he could chop it up and fuck with it. Exactly. Of... <laughs> yep. This is a quote. We were there for 15 minutes. It was clear that the committee was unable to comply with the regulations regarding use of deposition authority and moreover has no interest in complying with the regulations. And that's from Parlator. What? Yeah, that's ridiculous. Went on to say we're happy to provide the information if they can either do it fairly or legally, or if we can reach a resolution on how to do a voluntary interview, which minimizes the risk of election interference. Maybe you shouldn't have stormed the fucking Capitol. I mean, he whatever, he wasn't there. It's fine. He was there. Yeah. Yeah. Mastriano. Yeah. <laughs> Mastriano was seen outside, exactly outside the Capitol on the day of the insurrection and was in regular communication with Donald as he tried to overturn his election loss to Biden in Pennsylvania and other places. His attorney denied that Mastriano knew anything ahead of time about the Ugh. insurrection or any coordinated attack on the Capitol. Bullshit. Yeah, we didn't ask you if it was coordinated, but nope. thanks for telling us, Mr. Attorney from Mastriano. <laughs> Man, they keep doing this, don't they? They keep saying the inside part out loud. They're not fucking smart. All right, everybody, we'll be right back with Pete Struck, and we're going to discuss the implications of the raid on Mar-a-Lago and some counterintelligence stuff, maybe some 951 stuff, 611. I don't know, you know, just some stuff. Stay with us. After these messages, we'll be right Hey everyone, you know how much I love my Helix mattress, so I'm excited to announce Helix has gone beyond the bedroom and started making sofas. They launched a new company called Allform, and they're making premium customizable sofas and chairs shipped right to your door. They offer you a choice of fabric that is spill stain and scratch resistant, so it's great for pod pets. You can choose the color, the leg finish, the sofa size, the configuration to make sure it fits perfectly in your home. It's the easiest way to customize a sofa using premium materials, but at a fraction of the cost of traditional stores. They've got armchairs and love seats all the way up to eight seat sectionals. And the one I chose was a three seater sofa with a chaise lounge on the side. It's whiskey colored leather. It's got walnut leg finish. It's amazing. It's comfortable. It got here fast. I love the way it looks in my living room. All form sofas are also delivered directly to your home with fast free shipping three to seven days in the mail. And you can assemble it yourself in a few minutes with no tools needed. Also, you get 100 days to decide if you want to keep it. And if you don't love it, they'll pick it up for free and give you a full refund. But you'll love it. They also have a forever warranty, literally forever. So to find your perfect sofa, check out allform.com slash daily beans. And right now, Allform is offering 20% off all orders for listeners. That's allform.com slash daily beans. Everybody, welcome back. Happy to be joined today by the author of Compromised. You must buy it if you have not. It's Pete Strzok. Hi, Pete. Hey, Allison. So let's talk a little bit about this Donald Trump raid, shall we? Because or, you know, search warrant. Not really. There's a difference between a raid and a search warrant. I'm maybe I'm not sure. The Washington Post is reporting that he perhaps was didn't hand over all the documents the National Archives wanted back. But that can't be just it. Right. I don't think you would go to this length and get this signed off probably by the attorney general himself and get a judge and a search warrant and all that stuff for for just, you know, oh, you just mishandled some 
some documents. Can you talk a little bit about this? Because you, you, I think, executed some search warrants on uh, Hillary Clinton. Yeah, um, we did. And it was, you know, things related to that investigation, not her specifically. But, you know, the, the funny thing about that is, you know, at the time, there were absolutely no, the Republican outrage that we've seen over the past 24 hours was shockingly absent. And I'm certain in the days ahead, they will think back and recall those same search warrants and moderate their cries of outrage. But it, none of this, this could not, what's interesting to me is what, how and if this was a surprise at all to anybody in the Trump world. Because if you think about the interactions about what he took with him out of the White House and whether or not he should have had it, at least going back until May of 2021, it looks like that the National Archives reached out and asked, it appears, you know, do you have stuff which to ask that there, they would have to have some reason to ask. Now, whether that's because they had, there are a lot of people kind of asking loaded questions about, is there stuff missing that either the archives or in the intelligence community was tracking that they were aware was not returned? And nobody has said that directly, but there have been a lot of questions where people are sort of intimating. If I had to read between the lines, the media may have some sourcing which is not good enough to publish, but a real question of whether or not, you know, there are things that are known to be missing and I would assume to be classified, not just some unclassified thing that were, that were causing these conversations. So anyway, so more than a year ago, you have this outreach, January of this year, National Archives gets a ton of boxes, I think 12, 15, whatever it was. They see what appear to be classified information. They get in touch with the executive branch. The executive, the executive branch gets a subpoena to obtain it from the archives, DOJ does. That's reviewed sometime in the April timeframe, I think. And then you have, at least as I think CNN's reporting in June, so now for a full year later, right? This started the May of the prior year, this dialogue, a group of DOJ personnel, at least one uh, prosecutor, the chief of the, what's now called the counterintelligence and export control section, who's a, a prosecutor I worked with for 15 years, um, very seasoned in the field of national security, very experienced in dealing with cases involving classified information in cases involving, you know, violations of all the criminal codes that deal with classified information. He is down there along with three other people, uh, some mix of either all agents or agents and other prosecutors. And it appears they have some look around that includes visiting this basement room where they are concerned enough about what they see that after they leave five days later, they send a letter to Trump's attorney saying, you need to lock that up. And allegedly they put a padlock at the door, which, you know, what was it before? Like, you know, it's, 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 <laughs> I, 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 you know, somewhere between the, uh, you know, the, the buffet line and the cold storage that, you know, is sealed with a bunch of empty ketchup packets wedged in the door. I don't know what was securing it before that, but clearly they saw something in there. And then about two months later, then we have the execution of the search warrant. So there was part of that search warrant, a dialogue between DOJ attorneys and Trump attorneys. The reason typically you would involve at this stage a DOJ attorney is if you're talking to attorneys on the other side, it isn't, you know, me and you, a couple agents going and talking to somebody to interview them. Usually you're engaging in some dialogue, which to me kind of seems like they're trying to negotiate something, whether they're trying to negotiate consent to get everything. Something happened that they decided consent wasn't going to work. We need to go get a warrant. And, you know, whether or not, I also, I'm always surprised that the, the amount of credence people give to Trump's description of what occurred mm -hmm. is always a little surprising to me because it's not, you know, his, his view of reality is kind of a, you know, in a, not even an impressionistic, but like a kindergarten version of Dali painting a, a landscape of what happened. So I, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's, uh, you know, it's yeah. the, and then backing away, it's what everybody's saying for the last 24 hours. And, you know, we can talk about it with Rick Scott as well, but it's like, we have never like up until yesterday, there is no FBI agent in the history of the FBI who has ever executed a search warrant on a current or former president ever, ever. I don't, you know, did they, how they got some of the stuff, the Clinton impeachment stuff. I, I don't think that was a search warrant, but 
this is not, this is unprecedented. And I, on the one hand, that really worries me. On the other hand, it reassures me that nobody's above the law. So it, it isn't, it isn't normal by any stretch of the imagination. Now, the fact that the counterintelligence guy, you said, who was down there helping execute this warrant, Asha Rangappa posed something on Twitter that I thought was interesting, that this might not be a criminal investigation. It might be a counterintelligence uh, operation to neutralize a threat. And now she said mischief managed and it could be over. I don't know uh, what you what you think about that. I don't, you know, I was talking to Asha earlier about this. I don't think it, it, it's not. Anytime somebody tries to separate counterintelligence from criminal, I I think typically there are always, almost always, elements of overlap between those two ideas. And to try and distinguish them sometimes can be unhelpful. I do think it's clear, you know, a a criminal search warrant was issued. This was not a warrant issued by the FISA court. This was a criminal search warrant, which means a judge found, based on an application by agents, and an affidavit that there's probable cause to believe that there's evidence of a crime now at Mar-a-Lago. And that, and you know, again, that, that's what that means. That is the standard to obtain a search warrant. So at the same time, there's, I, I look at this in many ways, well, in some ways, kind of as analogous potentially to what happened with Clinton's use of a private email server. There are three big things that you want to understand, right? One is, you know, what's, what's all the classified there? What is it? Where is it? What's the totality of it? Do we have all of it? Is something shoved away somewhere else up at Trump Tower? Did somebody walk away with some? But let, let's get a big catalog of everything we possibly can of all the classified, know exactly what it is, where it came from, who owns it, classification level is, date of it, all those sources and methods that are implicated in it. That's the first thing. Second thing you want to do and the hardest and the most important from a criminal perspective is why is it there? It's not supposed to be there. So who put it there? What, what did they know about it? Were they doing it intentionally? Were they trying to hide the fact that they did it? Did they do it for somebody else? Were they doing it in somebody's direction? You know, was this just something where like Trump told them he took it himself and didn't let anybody see him? Did some poor moving guy just get directions to go in the bedroom and pack everything up? He had no idea what he was doing and he couldn't even read English to see classification markings. All those things about what people knew, those things go to the idea of whether or not in a criminal context, you can establish a crime and charge it and prove it. And then the third thing is, did anybody who, sh- a bad guy get it, right? Worst case of foreign nation, the hostile foreign nation of Russia, China, Cuba, Iran, whatever, but any, really any foreign actor or a mischievous hacker or just a, you know, a bad criminal person, somebody meandering through Mar-a-Lago who was, you know, looking to steal jewelry and happened to steal some classified information. And you want to know that because you need to understand if they got a hold of a document, is that putting human sources at risk? Is that putting technical sources at risk? Is that going to impact our intelligence collection? And how do we mitigate that? So those, it's not a magic formula, but those three broad ways to think about this are, are the way we thought about the Clinton case. I mean, they're very different aspects to it, but as a template of how to go about thinking of the investigation of the classified material at Mar-a-Lago that shouldn't have been there. It's a pretty good template in my mind. And I, Mm. I suspect, I certainly hope that's what DOJ is trying to do. Yeah. And we just got news too that, uh, oh, well, news from Scott Perry, that Scott Perry's phone was confiscated by the FBI. No, Allison, Allison, what he said, let me read it. I'm going to interrupt you for a second to say, because (laughs) I love this. He was quote, this morning while traveling with my family, three agents visited me. Visited, they yeah. Mu- visited, much like the angel of death eventually visits us all, but they, they didn't. It was very, they visited. It's a very, let's say, a welcoming, open... I'm sorry, they, I didn't mean to. They, it was, no, it was it's, just the way it, we, his, his statement was really funny, but I thought it was interesting that he, he said they were FBI agents and not Department of Justice Office of Inspector General agents, who are the folks who confiscated Eastman's phone and then went to Clark's house to get all of his stuff. And you and I talked a little bit about, we, we were like, why the OIG? You know, what, what's going on with that? Why the OIG and not the FBI? And in a recent filing, we found out that, you know, because Eastman had argued that the DOJ, Office of Inspector General, has no jurisdiction over him. And the Department of Justice's response to that was, 
Yeah, but if you were involved in a criminal conspiracy with someone in the DOJ, then yeah, it is in our jurisdiction. And I I just thought that was a really interesting, I've never read anything quite like that in a court filing. They talked about this part of the investigation being the pre-indictment phase. And they mentioned future criminal charges. And, and if, if they gave the phone back, because that's what Eastman wanted was to get his phone back. If they gave the phone back, then that would severely you know, hamper any future investigation or charging decision by a, by a grand jury. So I thought it was really interesting. I, you know, I learned that the Department of Justice Office of Inspector General can execute search warrants and do investigations if the person that they're looking into doesn't work for the DOJ, as long as, you know, the evidence that they would get from them has something to do with someone in the DOJ or they're in some sort of a criminal conspiracy, which they mentioned by the way, without really being asked <laughs> about that. So I, I thought that was a little kind of like a speaking filing. Yeah. And it is interesting, too, in the context of some of the whether or not that should cause all of us concern, because clearly the IG and I take the filing at its word. They're looking primarily at Clark. That led them to Eastman, whether they were searching for evidence of Clark's crimes on Eastman's phone or Eastman independently as a co-conspirator. But one that the Eastman had a lot to do with a lot of stuff beyond just poor Jeffy Clark. And if if the IG is out there sort of out ahead, again, that's potentially fine. I'm glad it's getting done. But when the IG seizes Eastman's phone, that is going to be very alerting to a lot of people that Eastman was involved with outside of just, you know, Clark there in his bathrobe on the, uh, in his house here in Northern Virginia. And Added to that fact that, you know, Wyndham signed that second application for a search warrant of apparently Eastman's phone. So, you know, the IG gets it. They get that. It's not clear what the scope of their authority to search it was or wasn't, but it is clear at some point after that, Wyndham, that is the the prosecutor leading the January 6th investigations, seeks a second warrant to search that and obtains it. So those are different things. I, I don't know how you detangle them from each other because it seems to me all part of one broad pattern of activity. But again, I I can only hope that somebody has sat all these folks down, at least investigatively together in a big bullpen, and they're all sort of showing up to work together, chatting over coffee together, exchanging leads together, and doing the investigation in uh, as efficient a way as possible. Before I let you go, do you think that the Scott Perry, first, first of all, sitting member of Congress, um, search warrant for his phone, that's big news. And again, something that would have to be, I'm assuming, signed off by very, very top people, if not the top person, Merrick Garland, if these were, in fact, just FBI agents and not, you know, OIG or DOJ agents or postal cops or NARA historian cops or anything like that. But does that seem connected at all to the Mar-a-Lago raid? Could it be? I mean, they both, you know, Meadows was in trouble for not handing stuff over to the National Archives. And he he had a lot of conversations that went to signal with Meadows and we haven't heard from Meadows and Trump's lawyers told Trump to stop talking to Meadows. I don't know. It just it seems I feel like I feel like we're trying to piece together all these separate instances of, you know, the tiny things, the crumbs that we get for clues. And, and I just have no idea how these all fit together. Yeah. So my gut sense is it's not. I think this is and you make an absolutely accurate point. I mean, it is in some ways. To issue a search warrant on an ele- one, an elected person, two, in a separate branch of government, there are all kinds of additional hurdles when, in the context of when the FBI or another federal investigative agency out of the executive branch were to seek and obtain a search warrant for a member of Congress, not their staff, but a member, they're really high hurdles. I mean, it's the same standard, a problem cause, but the approval process is, is significantly more, has significantly more oversight. And I would be shocked if the attorney general and certainly Director Ray were not well aware in advance and either approved and or did not object to seeking of that search warrant, and as well as the U.S. attorney for whatever office was there. So, you know, it is a big deal. I don't I don't think it's quite as big deal as, as Trump getting mm-hmm. a search warrant. But these are like one, if you like look at the field of runners, I mean, you have somebody who wins the race and then two seconds behind you get Rick Scott. And then think of it as your listeners, all the, the Eastman's, the Clarks, they're like, a full lap behind. I mean, these are really, Mm. in terms of significance and rarity and things that caused me to really sit up and take notice, these two things certainly 
at least at this moment, really stand out as separate and distinct from the rest of the pack. As the timing, I, mm-hmm. the, I don't think they're related, just out of a gut sense that I don't see something being able to. Everything seized from Trump's place, presumably, is going to go through a filter team, both in the seizure point as well as in the review, because there's inevitably going to be stuff that's privileged there, and you don't want that tainting the investigative team. So I am hard-pressed to find a way that material that was seized from Trump yesterday could be processed. And look, and, and you take it again, this may all be paper. I'm, mm. I'm very curious to see if Trump releases his inventory list to see, is it all documents? Is there computer media there? Are there CDs, thumb drives? Or is it all just paper? But I, I can't easily envision a scenario where that would be exploited in time for people to see, understand what they have, figure out, okay, we've got to go get a search warrant for an elected member of Congress and have that all happen in less than 24 hours. Don't see it happening. What no. I do see is, and I think Ellie Hunting pointed this out as who I first heard it from, this traditional 90-day DOJ moratorium on take, not taking any overt action before the election. I think today we're at like 91 days to go before the midterm elections. So I can see at DOJ, we're not going to do anything overt that could impact the election starting 90 days out. I think that starts tomorrow. So that, to me, would be the thing. All these disparate things which may relate to elected officials, get them done now, because come August 10th, we're not doing anything until November, you know, whatever. Yeah. And I wasn't I wasn't necessarily thinking that anything in the boxes that they got and or paper or whatever that they got from Mar-a-Lago tipped them off to Perry. I was thinking more along the lines of they got Meadows phone in April. And maybe there's stuff in there that tipped him off to Perry and perhaps even what was going on at Mar-a-Lago, because I know Meadows was one of the seven appointed people to act as Trump's representative to the National Archives. So could I mean, again, I'm yeah. just speculating. No, that's that's a good point. And that's that's certainly possible. And it could be one of those things, you know, Trump will be the trigger because he's the most important thing. But things that trickle from that, you know, do it as close. And the only reason we know, I think, is because Scott went and told Fox News. So, you know, that was seems like a deliberate choice on his part to make that public that had he not done that, we wouldn't know about it right now. Yeah. And I was wondering if anybody else who's been exactly. searched is going to come forward right. to, and, to and join has, together. Has made a different decision. Like, we're not going to go yeah. public right now. So there may be other stuff right now bubbling away. Yeah. And, and who else is going to come forward and say they were searched? And, and maybe they'll drop some other warrants before tomorrow's up. We'll see. We'll know. And then, of course, it might they might not be doing 90 days. They might do the 60 day thing. I mean, it's kind of it's unwritten anyway. So who knows? We'll see. But thank you. I appreciate your time today. And thanks for spelling that out, because there's just so much that we don't know. And, uh, you know, I don't want to go too far off this on this, you know, the speculation path. But I think that there are some things that we can that we know for certain. So I appreciate you sharing that with us. Yeah, of course. All right, everybody stick around. We'll be right back with the good news. Hey everyone, it's AG from Muller She Wrote and The Daily Beans. And Steve Pearson from the How We Win podcast. We're bringing together some of our besties for a live super pod to raise money for the How We Win Fund and elect Democrats in November. Featuring us, of course. The hilarious Frangela duo. Ben and Brett Mazelis from the Midas Touch podcast. And the one and only Kathy Griffin. Join us on Monday, August 22nd at Largo in Los Angeles. Go to HowWeWinLive.com and get your tickets now. That's HowWeWinLive.com. Everybody, welcome back. It's time for the good news. Who likes good news, everyone? Then good news, everyone. Good news, good news. And if you have any good news, corrections, confessions, will be stories, what your small business is, you want us to give you a shout out, pod pet picks, anything, send it in to us at uh, what, dailybeanspod.com and just click on contact. And then also, if you want to come to the live show on August 22nd with myself and Kathy Griffin and Midas Touch and Frangela and the How We Win podcast, all you got to do is go to howwewinlive.com for tickets. It's at Largo in LA. And every single penny that you spend on your ticket goes toward the midterm elections, Dems and candidates, Dem candidates who need it the most. So uh, I'm excited for that. I'm going to kick us off with Margot. No pronouns given. Hey, Beans Queens. It's Margot from Butthole v. Margot. 
and I'm still butthurt over losing that case. Oh my God, I love our listeners. <sighs> no, seriously, that's my first name. And I want to thank you for making my iced coffee come out of my nose. <laughs> <laughs> After I heard that, I figured it was a sign to finally write it and tell you how much I appreciate your podcast. I live in a ruby red county in western New York with my wonderful left-leaning husband, a dog and a cat, and I've been a fan of yours since the kitchen table days. It can feel isolating being surrounded by people who can be the poster children for the Dunning-Kruger effect, <laughs> but we remain strong, and every once in a while, we see little cracks in the facade that is defending the mango Mussolini. Our 11-year-old rescue cat, Patchy, who literally showed up on our back patio 10 years ago, one night, feral and begging to be saved, has turned into the world's biggest cuddle bug. No pics this time, because when you see our dog, you'll know why. <laughs> I have attached pictures of our baby, Biggie Boy Cookie Gilchrist. <laughs> oh my God, I love this person. <laughs> Named after the Buffalo Bills running back from the 60s. Now I'm Now my next cat has to be Jim Brown. Okay. Husband is a huge Bills fan, and when we went to meet this litter of eight-week-old puppies, he marched right out of the crate and threw himself into his arms. I knew at that moment I would have no say in naming him. He's been our light during these dark times and gets us out of bed every day, as have you. Thanks for all you do, AGDG and the whole Beans gang. Feel free to guess his breed. Oh, well, that boy's a boxer. Look at this damn puppy. What else? Maybe a, I was going to say a Sharpay, but probably not. But that's that. Boxer, Mastiff, Feline Assault. Oh, my <laughs> Bad God. Pet. Um, Boxer Shepherd? No, Boxer. Mastiff, uh, Shepherd. There's a little Shepherd in there. Hard to tell. Big dog either way. Let's see. Cute. Rhodesian Ridgeback and Boxer. There, there we you go. go. Adorable dog. All right, this next one's from you, Frozeny. No pronouns given on this. Hello, I have a great bit of good news. I just got a new job in the legal profession. I will be support staff for litigation lawyers, and I can't be more excited. I can finally put my weird need to research one topic exhaustively to good use. <laughs> <laughs> AG, if you enjoy Party in the USA, you should check out Party in the CIA by Weird oh. Al. It might fit the Trump raid a bit, better. Hopefully you'll keep getting reasons to play it. Pet tax, three of my furry babies, pool day, and my disturbingly large 12-inch goldfish, Mr. Hmm. Darcy. 12-inch goldfish? What? Or is that centimeters? No, that's an inch. Wait, is that just two things? 12 inches. Yeah. Wait. Whoa. No, because that makes it, it's a foot-long goldfish. That can't be right. I guess it could be. Mr. Darcy. All right. Well, that doesn't look like a foot long. Maybe it's a centimeter. Oh my God. We're a but mess. There's nothing, there's nothing for comparison. So right. it's hard I to tell. I think it's centimeter. Otherwise, those are also some very big rocks. That's still pretty fucking big. It's a big fish for a goldfish. <laughs> this is a big fish story, isn't it? It is. It's a big fish story. And we, my, made it, my... we went from centimeters to, I'm like, it's 12 <laughs> feet long. Typical bro. It is inches. You're right. <laughs> oh my god, that goldfish Just is because you showed it to me twice. Doesn't make it twelve inches. Oh my god. <sighs> All right. My aunt had a goldfish that lived to be 21 years old. I swear to fucking god, 21. That's amazing. Kept on top of the fridge. Something about the vibrations and the warmth up there. I don't know. But maybe I want to move on forever. to the fridge. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Like, is it just at the fountain of youth up there? Uh huh. Next up from Gian is pronoun she and her. I've been wanting to submit good news so I could share photos of my grand pup as pet tax. Uh, Janice and everyone, you do not need an excuse to send in photos of your pets. It can just be photos of your pets. In my dreams, something like getting an airport or bus station selfie with Giuliani as I extend my middle finger in the background. But alas, this fantasy has gone unfulfilled, so I will simply revel in the raid of Mar-a-Lago. Pet tax attacked Fenway. My daughter nice. likes to dress him up for Halloween. Oh, my God. Look at this. Is this a, a Samiad? Fenway's adorable. Oh, what oh an my adorable God. dog. <laughs> Look at the knight with the sword. I know. And the dog's so easy, like, happy about all this. Yeah, that's a chill-ass dog. Seriously. All right. Thank you so much. This is for Matt F. in Central PA. No pronouns given. Aloha, beans queens, which is what they say in Central PA. This will be my first, but certainly not my last writing in. My good news is several fold, but I'll try to be as concise as I can. I might fail, but I'll try. My epic wife love, my epic wife love and I, cute, 
had the distinct pleasure of attending the DC meetup a couple of months ago. We had so much fun meeting AG, it genuinely made our year. I want to propose a new game where people brag about their amazing partners. I love this. We're over. I post about her on social media and I usually say, on today's episode of Holy Shit, I Love My Wife. But I'm sure you or our awesome sauce family can come up with some fun name for it. Many, usually male friends of ours, will comment, LOL, come on, bro, you're making us look bad. And to that, I say, fucking good. If you have someone amazing <laughs> in your life, do your best to deserve that person. Who is this person, Matt? He's I'm so in... cool. I met them. They're just the coolest couple ever. I want to date Matt and I'm a lesbian. Okay. I know. I so... know. <laughs> Let us know, Matt. <laughs> so no, hang on to that. He's obviously got a great wife. Here's my first entry. My absurdly fucking amazing and epic wife, Becca, is very seriously the best person who's ever existed in my life, time, and space. I'll start with her calling. When she was 26, she started the first ever hair salon for children and both children and adults with special needs called Tangled Manes in East Petersburg, Pennsylvania. Quote, holy shitballs. You're asking yourself, why isn't that absolutely everywhere? I fucking know, right? You have a child who has brittle bone? Sensory issue? Is six foot three and nonverbal? How the hell do you cut their hair? You take them to see Miss Becca and her team and they will work what can only be described as magic. Not only is she the most caring, sweet, bright, gorgeous human I've ever encountered, she's the guardian angel of those who need a little extra assistance in their life. She works with every major pediatric center on most of the Eastern seaboard, and every couple of months, buses from CHOP, um, C-H-O-P, Schreiber, or somewhere else, arrive at the salon so she can cut hair for their little patients. And that's just what she does for work. Becca's just stupid fucking gorgeous, and it's physically impossible not to fall desperately in love with her. Her laugh is my favorite thing in the world. Seriously, not boobs or sexy time, not travel or Star Trek, her laugh. I love in the evenings when she's scrolling through TikTok and I'm just watching her burst into uproarious laughter with a big smile so big my cheeks hurt the next day. She's kind and generous and brilliant, mischievous. She likes to wait outside and throw snowballs at me in the winter and routinely pranks her dad and brothers. Okay, I'd actually date either of you at this point. Now, okay, <laughs> attached her photos of Becca, the shot that is the background of my phone, and a photo of us with AG. Dana, good fucking luck not falling. See? <laughs> Dana, good fucking luck not falling in love with her, but it's okay. Becca has a, oh my God, Becca has a big crush on you too. <laughs> <laughs> this old Matt, Matt. All right, this is super fun. Okay, pot pet tax. Are our three boys, Greg, Eric, and Lucy the boy. Greg is the giant 23-pound tuxedo void who has flopped onto the floor for pets. Eric is the sweet black and white boy with the bow tie. And Lucy is the gorgeous gray boy who has both arms up on my shoulders, gazing into my eyes, asking for pets, no doubt singing, Papa, can you hear me? Papa, can you feel me? Oh okay. my God, Matt. And Becca, this first goddamn picture of him picking her up by the ocean mm -hmm. and kissing her. Mm -hmm. You guys, I love yeah, both of you the, so much. The best yeah. And Becca, I love all your little freckles. And Matt, I love your heart. I can't wait to meet you both. Mm -hmm. And I love this game. If you think you can beat Matt on talking I mean, about how awesome your luck. spouse is, yeah. send it into us. Send oh, it into us. I love these I also humans. want to see your. Your Dolly uh, mashups too, but this you is yeah. Guys, this is how love should be celebrated. Mm -hmm. Yep. Look at these kitties. Hello. Hi, everyone. Oh, oh they're so adorable. I'm beside myself, I'm such a little romantic. Oh, yep. And there we are at uh, off yep. the record. There's That's you we with your sleeve, your sexy left sleeve. <laughs> yeah. That's me with the uh, Matt and Becca couple, epic couple from oh Pennsylvania. Goodness. Thank you everyone for sending these in. These are amazing, wonderful, fantastic. And again, you know, you don't need an excuse to send me pet photos. You can just send them. And uh, if you want to tell us how great your spouse or significant other is, or even your kids or your best friend, send it in. Let's celebrate some other people. Give them a shout out on the show. You can do it at dailybeanspod.com and click on contact. Dana, you have any final thoughts? I mean, I have no final thoughts. I feel like Matt's submission is just awesome. Just love each other and celebrate each other. This is what you should do in this world. That's it. Yeah, I, I concur. And thank you so much, everybody. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow. 
you know, yesterday I was like, what news could possibly drop? And then they confiscate Scott Perry's phone. So <laughs> I'll ask again, what news could possibly drop tomorrow? We'll find out. I give the intro uh, 52 seconds tomorrow. OK, I'm all gonna right. Write down 52. To see how it goes. Until then, please take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Take care of the planet. Take care of your mental health. I vote blue over Q. I've been AG. And I've been DG. And them's the beans. The Daily Beans is written and executive produced by Allison Gill with additional research and reporting by Dana Goldberg and Amy Carrero. Sound design and editing is by Desiree McFarlane with art and web design by Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios. Music for The Daily Beans is written and performed by They Might Be Giants and the show is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, please visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media.